welcome to the first modular podcast interview, um, a sideshow to the normal monthly episodes that are topic based. Uh, still, me, Matthew, and Greg. Uh, Matthew, you all right? Hi. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks. Um, and Greg, how about you? Well, thanks, man. How are you? Yeah, good. And we've got Jason Am Solvent, um, part of I Dream of Wires and the new Electronic Voyager documentary. Um, how are you, Jason? Okay. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, so this is going to be completely interview-based on um, Jason and the things he's doing, the things he's done. We'll get to know him a little bit as well, um, as opposed to anything topical, but still the same casual sort of chat sort of environment that we've got going. Um, so, Jason, for those that don't know you at all, um, how would you introduce yourself? What do you do? What will people know you from? <clears throat> um, okay, well... I guess the thing that I've been doing for a while, I guess really since 1997, is releasing electronic music under the name Solvent. Uh, I've put out, I think, something like five albums. Uh, I run a record label called Suction Records. So I put out a lot of my stuff on my own label. Um, and then I'm also, I've also put out a couple albums on Ghostly International. Um, so yeah, I'm just an electronic musician, a gear analog synth junkie. Um, yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and just eventually, that sort of led me to, uh, to meet Rob, who's working here behind me, uh, who started a, a, a documentary on modular synthesizers. Um, and he basically just wanted me to interview me to start. Um, and then it sort of evolved. He asked me if I wanted to do the soundtrack for it. I was totally up for that. And then I just sort of kept, like, you know, suggesting different people that I thought he should want to talk to, ideas that I had for the film, and it just kind of grew from there. Um, and we ended up doing I Dream of Wires together. Um, and we've been working together ever since, and we're now actually just launching a, a new documentary about Bob Moog called Electronic Voyager. Ah, cool. So that's me and that's me and as a as a quick summary. <laughs> so that that's almost a summary of the whole show. We'll go back and pick at each of these points. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ian, so going r back to the music and the gear thing. Um, yeah. what were you into originally? M modular early on, or vintage gear, or computers even first? Um. Well, I started getting into electronic music like a long time ago. Um, probably in, it was when I was an early teenager, so it was like the late 80s. That's when I started, uh, like in Toronto, we had an alternative radio station, and at the time, you know, you would hear a lot of stuff on the radio, things like Depeche Mode, New Order, um, you know, Human League. Um, but even our station even got into some pretty out there stuff, like they would play a lot of the sort of like industrial dance stuff, Skinny Puppy, Front 242 even more obscure stuff along those lines, which was pretty interesting for a sort of like semi-mainstream uh, radio station. So I got really into that music uh, in the late 80s, and I've been basically obsessed with electronic music ever since then. Um, I think probably when I was about 17, I got my first synth, which, which was a, a Casio CZ5000, and I made some tracks with that. Um, but that kind of... I mean, at the time, I, did, I didn't really have the idea of, like, making music by yourself in your bedroom, instrumental stuff, you know, because I was listening to bands. So, you know, I, I considered that more like a hobby. I wasn't thinking, like, you know, I, I didn't know anything about, say, techno at the time. So the idea that you would just, you know, make music in your bedroom and then that, that would be something that anybody would want to hear was something that was just totally foreign to me. So I just, you know, I... I whittled away with my Casio CZ5000 tunes, but I wasn't really, you know, I didn't really take it seriously. Um, and then probably it was like around the time of, I'd say it was like the early 90s, I ended up hearing um, Aphex Twin. That was definitely the one that was like, you know, the, the like punk rock moment for me where I was like, wow, you can just, you know, do this yourself. You can... You know, I got the the idea that this was a guy who was just buying synths, making uh, instrumental electronic music 
um, in his bedroom, and it was awesome, and it was exactly what I wanted to hear at the time, and that was like my real revelation moment that, you know, uh, I just decided I have to get into this. So that's at that point, it was probably around 90, 93, I just started like obsessively buying synths, and, you know, it's just gone from there. It's never, never subsided. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of the... Well, the stuff you were getting to get into that, was that then drum machines, samplers? Were you still in the same way that someone might, you know, chase the guitar that their favorite rock band use, the, you know, the lead guitarist in the band or anything? Were you trying to buy keyboards and bits of gear that, um, well, bands like the Human League were using? Or was it very much sort of the sort of sampling and um, the root, sort of root of Aphex Twin and I guess things like Square Pusher as well? Right. Um, well, I started off with analog synths for sure. I mean, I you know I I was interested in I mean Aphex Twin when I first started off was definitely my number one influence. But I also had had these years of listening to synth pop, um, so I always had this idea that you know I did like analog synthesizer sounds. So that's kind of what I gravitated towards uh, immediately was just trying to pick up some some. Uh, vintage synths, like some of the sort, and they, I mean, they were, you know, the hype was there, but it was like, it was still pretty easy to get, um, you know, some pretty awesome synths for relatively cheap. Uh, I actually, you know, I mean, my entry into serious gear was, well, first of all, I, I got a Jupiter 6, that's the first analog synth that I ever bought, I think I got it in 93 or something like that. Um, but I actually had a really lucky incident where I uh, I was looking for a MIDI to CV converter, and there really weren't that many options at the time. You know, this was before the internet, so I was like, if I'm going to get analog synths, I need to make sure that I can sequence them because I'm not like going to play them by hand or anything like that. You know, <laughs> I'm a, I wanted to make like robotic sequencer music, so there's no way I was like just going to start buying up synths without like nailing down the MIDI to CV part to start. Yeah. Um, so. I found an ad for an MPU 101. That's at, at the time, you know, pre-internet. Really, that was the only MIDI to CV converter that I was aware of that existed, uh, and they were not easy to find. But I found this like ad in the local buy and sell for a for a for a MIDI to CV converter, and I like rushed out to get it. And the guy there was like, "So, you know, what do you want this for? Why why, why do you want this?" He actually had the ad in like the stereo section, so he must, you know, didn't really ha he wasn't up on what was going on. He was like, what do you want this thing for? And I was like, well, you know, I'm looking to get into buying analog synths, and I just want to have this so that I can, you know, sequence them over MIDI when the time comes. And he's like, oh, you know, you want analog synths? I've got some if you're interested. And I was like, okay, yeah, sh show me what you got or whatever. And he opens up this closet, and he had a mini Moog and a Moog Prodigy, uh, and I ended up getting all three for $250. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was my. That was my. Like, I, I actually, you know, what I actually ended up doing was selling the mini mode, which I totally regret now. But at the time, it was actually cool because that was like one of the few synths that actually sort of really had had still like a significant value. So I actually ended up selling the mini mode for a thousand dollars, which was like pretty top dollar at the time, and that was enough to get me um, a TR eight hundred eight an MS-20, a mixer, and an effects processor, you know? So once I did that, I had my Jupiter 6 already. I was like, that core bit of gear was like what I recorded basically most of my first two albums on. Yeah. Interesting, if, we just, if I could just jump in and say that, though, you, you mentioned about, like, you know, pre-internet, pre-internet, and it's, it's really easy now to take it for granted, like any synth you want to find out about, dive onto the internet, and you can you can find pictures, history, etc. But when I was kind of collecting and getting my stuff and wanting to get into electronic music, I was like scouring over the back of LP sleeves that anything that may have had a little hint to what was being used on that record, and it was it really was like so hard. It was almost like you know some sort of form of electronic archaeology trying to find these kind of who, who uses this? What, what are these pieces of equipment? So it was really difficult to try and uh, track down these pieces before, you know, I mean, obviously you could buy, you know, magazines and things, but they didn't always cover the gear that had gone by, as it were. 
So yeah, I totally appreciate. Here's yeah. here's 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 another thing related to that. I mean, not only just finding the gear, but like, for example, you know, I listened to a lot of records that had these drum drum machine sounds that I wanted, and you know, eventually I was able to determine that a lot of the time it was a Roland TR808, and a lot of the time it was a Roland CR78. Um, and so, like I say, I was able to track down Roland TR808, and you would think, you know, you, would, you wouldn't you would be able to understand if you were getting into this stuff in the internet era, how you just you buy an 808, and you bring it home, and then you're like, okay, now I'm going to just sync this up to my computer, and you're like, well, wait a minute, it doesn't have MIDI. And then you're like a whole new mystery that you have to solve. You know, you couldn't just go, oh, well, how do I sync my TR808? I mean, it was like every step of the way like was was some kind of mystery to overcome and you'd have like a few friends that you could call up and say like do you know what this you know what this din sync is you know but it was like the whole thing was a real uh, a real mystery to get involved in it was like a real uh, challenge so i think that you know it was kind of interesting cuz it it kind of weeded out a lot of people who weren't super serious about it because if you wanted to like crack crack all this stuff you had to like really be determined well, like when I 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 when then there was one little small box, but like now there's lots and lots of companies. But, but the t again, at the time, I, I did the same thing of like, all oh, right, um, how can I make that talk to this now? You know, and but yeah, it's, it was tricky. But yeah. I think it's the people getting into modular now, I think, not to such an extent because you just jump on the internet and you find out within five minutes, but you get into it and you figure out oh, what, what's a clock, what's CV. What's a VCA? You've still sort of got all these building blocks of the older gear, but it is just five minutes away on the internet. I think that's the difference. Because friends, I tell this stuff to and then show things and we play and jam together. That great players, they're great on many synths, but with the modular side, it just cripples people straight away. Um, so I can, I remember it doing for me as well. I felt fairly competent with a synth, and then I bought a few modules and just felt like I had no idea what was going on at all. Yeah. Well, here's what I think. I think, you know, to be into modular stuff now, you have to be moderately determined. But I feel like to have made music with analog synths that didn't have MIDI circa, like, 1992, you had to be really determined. Because, no. like, honestly, you had, to find, you had to have, like, a friend that you could call on the phone and say... Do you know how to sync an eight oh you know a TR eight oh eight? What's this DIN sync? What boxes are available to do this? And and you know you were lucky if that friend had the answer. That friend may have just by chance have like read some obscure article in Keyboard Magazine from nineteen eighty three and happened to know the answer, or maybe not. You know what I mean? It was like this information was so hard to come across. I mean, modular. Yeah, yeah you're gonna have to figure some stuff out to get involved and it's going to be you know way too much of a hurdle for some people but if you want to figure out the answers it's not going to be a really long path to get your answer you're just going to type it up on <laughs> yeah yeah that, that's sort of what I'm saying that the, the, yeah. the same sort of struggle as it were is is nearly there but you've just you know five minutes away with your phone yeah. and you found a forum you know monthly post or exactly. answered your question so I, I can't I can't imagine that without being able to do that. Uh, yeah, I, I, probably me and you, Greg, got into it about the same time, and I remember spending an afternoon trying to figure out what some of the stuff was, and that's with still looking on the thing and emailing friends, and you've got some analog sims, have you heard of this? And they might have a MIDI keyboard and or something, and they've no idea what this is, and it still took a while. So, yeah, that's pretty nuts, <laughs> trying to... <laughs> But I, it's, it's kind of cool that it weeds people out in a way, in a strange, uninviting way. Because uh, yeah. I sort of think the people that, that really saw it through would then really be adamant that they made some music on it. I think once you've sort of climbed that hurdle, the relief must have been, um, well, encouraging to actually make some music, I think. 
Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I mean, that's it. I, I just, I, I think if you got to that point where you could actually, you know, figure out how to sequence your, your, your mini Moog and your MS20 and have your 808 clocking along with every, with your computer, the whole lot. If you got to that stage in like 1992, you were, you were in it for real. You know what I mean? Like you, if you got that far, you were going to do something with it because that took a lot of effort to figure that out. Yeah. And to track down those pieces, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and not... As Ben said, when me and Ben got into it around the same time, and when we got into it, there is a lot of reading to go through. When you... I mean, I think both of us had hardware before we got into modular. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of reading to get into, and that's difficult enough, just trolling through the amount that you need to read to figure it all out, to try and... We knew where to find that, but to try and look for that and hunt it down at the same yeah. time must have been an absolute nightmare back then. Yeah. And you know what? I can't even read manuals anymore. Like, I'm done. I, 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 <laughs> I, I'm done with manuals. I, I put in my time, and I'm done with manuals. I, I, I won't, can't read them anymore. All I do is just, like, go to, go to the, uh, the div kit videos. That's, that's what I do if I want to figure out a module now. That's, or, you know, one of your... One of, one of your colleagues or whatever. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely something to be said there from um, from probably what uh, Jason and I have, have the path that we've come into is from buying, you know, a, a gratuitous amount of like analog um, monosets. It's just that. Oh, Matthew's frozen. <laughs> Matthew froze. <laughs> Let's see if he comes back. <laughs> They never find out. But, uh, and, you know, <laughs> Sorry, Matthew, start again. You, you, you oh. just said about buying a gratuitous amount of analog gear and then like this. All oh, right, I see. <laughs> then I froze. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that actually coming from that path and just buying uh, monosense does stand you in good stead for going into modular. Just because like, I had a, an SH101 for probably 10 years before I got into anything modular. And just using that synth in that simple signal path of oscillator, filter, envelope, uh, envelope ADSR, whatever, I think that that just helped me so much go from that to modular gear. You know, whereas perhaps someone who maybe have, has come from the route from being just software inside the box computer and then jumping into modular may not have had a a similar sort of smoother path, I guess. I mean, who knows? But I mean, there's lots of no, software there, but it really did help me just being able to see, you know, from a simple synthesizer to that, you know. Well, that's what I was going to say, uh, Jason, to you, that did you feel, I mean, how did you get into modular after that? Because working with gear like that's a very sort of the studio is a big modular environment type thing, patching sync and clock around and MIDI to CV. Um, did that lead you to it, or was there a certain thing that sort of got you into modular? Um, well, I mean, first of all, I'll say one thing, because I'm sure that some people who, um, well, quite a few people that would watch this video <laughs> may have seen the, the hardcore edition of I Dream of Wires. Yeah. And there was quite a bit of, uh, well, you know, there was a whole segment in there on me kind of discovering modular and getting into it. Um, now, there was not a lot of manufactured segments in I Dream of Wires. I mean, there was just the one, and that was the one that, <laughs> the one about me, which was, you know, this idea that I was, that I didn't know anything really about modulars before that. Rob kind of thought it would be, a good, I mean, it was, it was kind of like a recreation of the truth, because I did have hesitations about uh, modular since, but the way that it kind of played out in the hardcore edition was actually a little bit kind of a recreation of what <laughs> what had happened because the truth is by the time I started I Dream of Wires I was already heavy into modular and I had been you know I had had a modular system a Dofer analog solution system like in the probably late 90s um, so I, I mean, I was interested in modular. I, you know, I there there was a thing that that I said in the hardcore edition, which was true. My my hesitation about modulars um, was really rooted in knowing Bruce Duncan, um, 
because I think it was like around 1996, um, I have a friend that I started my label Suction Records with. I know a guy, this was before we started the label, he was like, I know a guy who makes kind of cool Aphex Autecra style music. Um, you know, we both have some stuff. We should put a split split 12-inch out together. Um, and so he introduced me to this guy and played me some of his tracks, and we went over and met him, and that person was was Bruce Duncan. And he had, like, a whole studio full of, like, great analog synths. He had, like, a Juno 106, A08. Uh, he actually had a Oberheim Matrix 12, which is something I don't even know if I've even seen one since that. But he had great, you know, great vintage analog synth gear, and he was making some pretty cool music, and, you know, we talked about it, and I don't really remember why he sort of dropped out of the equation, but I ended up forming Suction Records with the other guy, um, and we, our first record was a split between the two of us, and this other guy, Bruce Duncan, kind of disappeared out of the picture. And then shortly after that, I heard that, you know, he had bought a massive surge modular system. He had traded all of his gear and he had bought this massive Surge modular system. And, like, you know, then you, I never heard a note of music out of him again. <laughs> and I sort of thought to myself, this is kind of what <laughs> modulars are to me, you know? Like, I don't want to I don't want to get lost in some, you know, world of obsessively exploring sound. You know, I was really driven at that time to make tracks. You know, I want to make tracks. I want to bang out tracks. I want to... I want an awesome kick drum quick. I want an 808. You know, I didn't want to, like, I, I found the idea of getting into modulars, what happened with Bruce kind of uh, gave me the impression that that was what modulars were. They were like, you know, you go down the wormhole and you're gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think people still do that. I think it still happens. It's a while because of that. It still happens. Sorry? I think that's, I think that's still happens. Still happen Ah, uh, we may have lost Jason as well. Uh oh, how did you? Uh, I'm still here. Oh yeah, he's here. Just I, am I here now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. minor dropout. I was just saying, I think that still happens now. People get lost down that wormhole of just experimenting with sound. They do, but I mean, the thing is, that was the only person I knew who got into modulars, and who, you know, you didn't meet people that were into modulars because, like, all of those systems were so rare and obscure. You know, this was, I mean, ModCan was the first new modular synth company uh, just slightly before Dofer. And, uh, I mean, there were some there's, there were some hangers on, like some that never went away, like Paya. Um, but ModCan was the first new one, and so this is pre-ModCan, remember? I'm talking about Bruce Duncan. So he was the only person I knew who kind of had gotten into modulars. Uh, and so this is the only person that I knew, and I thought, that's what happens, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Now I know that you can that way, but then other people are totally capable of uh, still being, you know, active with making music out of it. It's possible. Example was somebody who just disappeared down the rabbit hole, and he never came back. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Well, obviously, then started Modcan, and I imagine running that sort of company just. Yeah, I mean, he did great things, right? But I mean, you know, it's cool. It's it's great for everybody that he did that, but. Uh, at the time, knowing him outside of that, I just thought, yeah. I mean, it, that was like a, you know, this was like five years later. It was like the guy who made cool music disappeared, and then five years later, Mod King, you know. Mm -hmm. And he'll say now that, you know, he really ultimately never did sort of like fancy himself to be a musician. It was just kind of like what he ended up doing because that's what people did at the time. But once he kind of got the idea, hey, you know, I can build stuff, he decided that's what it was for him. He was really more of a engineer, tinkerer than a musician. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just not what I wanted to be at the time. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Um, so, I mean, obviously Bruce is in the documentary um, as well. And who else were you sort of meeting around the time? Was there anyone else that linked into the documentary? Or did it just happen because the documentary was happening that you went to meet these people? Or... Well, I mean, I like I had known Bruce forever, and Robert, here behind me, 
uh, he he started the documentary without me. So he did a whole like there's a there's a very early trailer for I Dream of Wires, and it's and it's at the time it wasn't even called I Dream of Wires. It was called Modular the Documentary, and it starts off with like these uh, oscilloscope things spelling out the word modular. This was like the first promo. So when he did that one, I wasn't even involved at all. So he sort of he he put in a good. I mean, he interviewed Bruce locally. That was his first. That was the first interview for I Dream of Wires was Bruce, and it's it's actually an interview that um, that uh, didn't get used in the film. Like we actually, I actually went back and interviewed him again later. But uh, Rob did start off with Bruce, but then he also did a whole trip to New York where he got you know Morton Sabotnik, Mark Verbos. Uh, Richard Lanehart. I don't know a few other, few other people. Um, Lori Napoleon. She's the one that did that sort of telephone switchboard DIY. Yeah. Um, so he started it without me. So you know, I can't really speak about the exact beginnings because I wasn't quite there at the beginning. I sort of came on board after that. Yeah. So was there anyone out of curiosity that? you would have liked to have met for I Dream of Wires that you couldn't or um, that, well, I don't imagine anyone just outright wasn't into the idea, but is there anyone that you'd have liked to have been involved that, that you couldn't get to for any reason? Uh, yeah, there were quite a few. I mean, uh, there, I mean, for one thing, you know, a lot of people are like, when they're, when they're, you know, I guess what, what what do you call them? I'm going to try to call them something without being mean. But like these people who sort of like, why didn't you get this person? Like being all kind of, yeah. you know, it's like, do you not understand that just because you think of somebody in your head, that that doesn't mean that you have the ability to make that interview happen? Like, how could you have not included craft work? It's like, yeah. <laughs> tell me how to hook up craft work. Like, I I don't know what I don't know where where these like it's. I guess it's 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 almost like a compliment because you know they must be thinking that this documentary looks big enough that these guys could get it whoever they want. But I mean, it's a it's a miracle that we got like Trent Reznor and Vince Clark. You know, like that's a miracle. We're just like literally this me and this guy behind me are like the two guys who made I Dream of Wires. We don't have any like special connections in the world. You know what I mean? I just was like. I just plugged away until I was able to, you know, I, I was like, I remember when, when I first got, you know, on the project, I was like, if we could get Carl Craig in this, you know, we're pretty close to Detroit. If we could get Carl Craig, like, in this documentary, this could be something pretty big. You know, like, there was no, no way I thought that we were going to get Vince Clark, Trent Reznor, you know? So... Anyways, there's all these people like, oh, you know, why didn't you get craft work? How could you do this documentary and not include Wendy Carlos? It's like, so these, you know, these are all people. Of course, we would have loved to interview Wendy Carlos, craft work, Brian Eno, Aphex Twin, you know. Uh, well, I think that's I think not not everyone was was a possibility for us. And then also, you know, there's 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 certain people like, for example. Would have been great to to interview uh, Roger Eric from Synthesizers.com, but he lives in um, Texas, and we, we you know we didn't have the budget to just oh Roger Eric in Texas let's fly out and and visit him. We had to really like make every dollar count, so we had to go to places where we could get a bunch of people. So you know we would go to L.A. because there'd be tons of people there. We went to Nam, and we're able to get like all the Euro rack manufacturers all in one thing. We didn't have the luxury of like flying here and there all over the place to follow our whim, you know. So we had a lot of financial restrictions in that way. But I'll tell you who the number one, my number one regret about who we didn't get would be Don Bukla because we did actually have an agreement from him that he would be in I Dream of Wires and um, he said, I mean, over email, he said, like, come on up or whatever, and we'll 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 do it. Um, and so we went to Oakland, uh, where he is, and we luckily had something else to do there, which was there was a a, a modular synth meet, which we ended up using in the film. That's where we interviewed uh, 
Gurr from Tip Top Audio and uh, Eric Barber, which was like one of the best interviews in the film for sure. So, you know, it wasn't a waste of time going out to Oakland, but our purpose for going there was to get Don Buchla. And then when we got there, he just didn't answer his phone. So, <laughs> you know, I, and I, I, I'm afraid we're, we're not, you know, we're not going to be getting an interview from Don Buchla. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think his health is so great anymore. So I really regret that we didn't get, you know, it's unfortunate that these two major pioneers of, you know, modular synthesis, Bob Moog and Don Buchla, I mean, obviously we were far too late for, for Bob Moog, but, you know, we really would have been so important if we could have gotten Don Buchla. But, you know, we made a lot of effort, and we tried all kinds of follow-ups, and it just, I mean, I guess he just doesn't like to be interviewed. That's fair enough. Um, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head that it's because of how big the documentary is and seems that it's so easy to sort of go, well, why didn't they speak to them? Why didn't they fly over to Europe and do all this stuff? And it's only because it, it looks as big as it is, um, I think. It's sort of perfect answer to that question. Cause it's, yeah. So it's nice in a way, but it's infuriating. You know what I mean? Like it, it's yeah. infuriating because it's like people yeah. think, like, do you really think that I didn't think about Wendy Carlos? Yeah. You know, like, oh, Wendy Carlos, what a strange idea, you know, like, <laughs> obviously, but that doesn't mean that just because you think of the idea that it can be done. You know, then, I worked to get yeah. Trent Reznor for, like, five months asking <laughs> everybody in the world I could yeah. to try to get Trent Reznor, you know, like, that was not easy. <laughs> but like you I just said there, I mean, about Don, it's like, the fact is, it's just the logistics of life. Like, you nearly had that interview, but the simple thing of someone not picking up the phone meant that they couldn't be in the couldn't be in the movie. You know, so it's all those kind of just the mundane logistical things as well that just mean you've got a time frame to do it, and if it doesn't respond or, you know, diaries don't match up, that's it. You know? Although, you know, with Don Buchla... That's it, you know. Yeah, although with Don Buchla, I mean... Did he just not pick up the phone by accident, or did he bring us out to Oakland and not pick up his phone and laugh about it, you know? I mean, he doesn't like to do interviews, and I think he might have been messing with us, you know? This is like the right. awesome mystery of Don Buchla. It's I don't know if it's just like, oh, he just forgot to pick up his phone. I mean, he, well, I won't even get into it, but anyways, who knows what happened there? Anyways, I read that one. It just seemed like it was there. He didn't get people like uh, Trent Reznor and Alessandro Cortini. People would be asking, why didn't you get Trent Reznor and Alessandro Cortini? Oh, yeah. yeah. did get those, so it's a bit of a known argument to try yeah. and make people that you didn't get. Yeah. You should talk with the people that you did get. Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, you know, I'm, you know I'm, not, I'm not one to, like, toot my own horn, but really, the amount of people, the people that we got in there... Yeah, yeah, it could be... It's impressive. impressive. It's impressive. For just, yeah. really, like, people need to understand, it's just literally... Me and Rob here that just did this, you know, we that's it. There was no, we didn't have any like studio backing us or anything like that. We were just like two dudes from Canada who just decided to do this, and it just kept growing to the point that eventually, you know, we were able to actually get somebody as as famous as Trent Reznor in it. It's it's like a miracle. <laughs> well, I, it's, it's funny mentioning all this stuff because. I've just put a video with Tony Ronaldo from Mate Noise, just and it's a really casual conversation outside the Super Booth that just happened. We sat outside by the River Spree, and as soon as we did this interview, and it was Matthew holding the camera, we were like, "Why aren't we doing more of this while we're at these events?" So then all this week, I sort of had a big come down after Super Booth, feeling sorry for myself that I want in the little <laughs> bubble that was the amazing Super Booth. But I've been thinking this week, yeah, we could do more of that if I could get over to the states. I could try and meet these guys, and then I, if I move from this state to this state, I'll get a couple more videos. And then, I mean, it's a thousand pound flight from the UK to America, uh -huh. and very much like you, I, I I wouldn't have any backing to do any of that. Uh, not that I'm trying to do my own documentary, but if I just wanted to go get a casual half an hour chat with someone, sat down together, it means flying somewhere, and it's just not yeah. feasible. Yeah, well, we didn't. I mean, we didn't have zero backing. You know, we 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 raised some money through Indiegogo, so it's not like we had zero backing. It's just that it wasn't like, 
substantial, you know. No, it's not <laughs> it enough. enough to, it was enough to, to 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 handle a flight to a place like L.A. where I knew we could get twenty interviews. It was not enough to say, oh, well, Roger Eric synthesizers.com lives in Texas. Let's fly to Texas. Like we had to make every travel count. You know, like like at NAM. I mean, the reason that we were able to get so many Eurorack manufacturers in I Dream of Wires is because literally what we did was we went to NAM. We got a hotel room that was like a 15 minute walk from the convention center and like from morning till night I walked back and forth and okay Tony Rolando's next you know brought him back to the hotel room like literally we did like 14 hour 12 or 14 hour days like this where it would just be like okay walk back to the NAM go get Scott from Harvest Man bring him back to the hotel you know so yeah that's I mean that's that's the way we had to do we had to make sure that every travel dollar like got us a lot of stuff yeah yeah it's gonna make sense uh, I mean I was gonna ask um, for the new documentary Electronic Voyager why Bob Mug over say Don Buckler or Serge I guess you've answered the question for Don Buckler that he's known to not want to be interviewed mm -hmm. I guess that makes that a more awkward a difficult thing to do and obviously is ill health at the minute as well um, but why I mean, it's fairly obvious for most of us in the civs but from your own perspective why is the new one the story of Bob Mark? Yeah okay well first of all I mean I, I, I would like to do a, a, a documentary about you know I would like for us to work on a documentary about Don Buchla and you know we're not gonna have Bob Moog for our Moog documentary so it's not necessarily crucial to have Don involved, but there was actually a Kickstarter for a Don Buchla documentary about two years ago that got funded, so at the moment it seems like there may be a, a Don Buchla documentary looming on the horizon, you know? Right. Um, so that's the reason why, you know, I didn't really consider, we didn't really consider doing a, a, a Don Buchla documentary. I mean, sir, like a documentary on somebody like Serge or somebody like, I mean, I just think that Sure, that would be cool in a way, but I don't actually know Serge's story, and I don't know if it's interesting or not. I know Bob Moog's story, and I know that it's very interesting. I've read the book Analog Days, and I, you know, pour over sites like the Bob Moog Foundation and read up, and, like, there's some really cool stories there. And, you know, one thing that we do hear a lot is, uh, well, there's already a Moog documentary. I mean, the thing is about that other Moog documentary, it's cool. I like it, but it's not, uh, it's not a historical documentary it's really just I mean they spent uh, the filmmaker spent like a few weeks here and there um, with Bob um, sort of like somewhere maybe two or three years before he died and he was just kind of getting back into uh, he had just gotten his I don't know if he didn't even gotten his name back I guess he had he had the he, he was he, there was the Voyager in there, so yeah, I guess he had just gotten the Moog Music name back and was just starting to, you know, just starting that company up. Um, but really, they, I mean, what that film was was this guy spent some time with with Bob Moog and they traveled around to a few different people and and filmed them having these conversations. I mean, I would say that it was, and I even the filmmaker himself describes it this way. It's really just sort of like a a portrait of. Bob Moog, a first-person portrait of Bob Moog, and it's really a lot about kind of like the type of person that he was. There's a lot of a lot of talk from Bob in that film about you know his spirituality. There's a lot of shots of him like in his garden, and things like that. Um, so you know that's a, that's a that's an interesting documentary, but it's really not. Um, I mean, I think that the story of Moog is like one of the most significant stories in synthesis if not the most I mean this the if anybody laid down more foundations for synthesis and electronic music you know Moog has got to be near the top and I just don't believe that the documentary that exists is really tells it's not a historical documentary and that's what we want to do we want to really uh, tell the story of Bob Moog yeah I mean, obviously, the legacy that is the 24 dB low pass filter is probably the biggest thing to happen to electronic music. Mm -hmm. Period. Um, 
But there, I mean, there, 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 there's just there's a lot of other things too. Like, I mean, the the ADSR, the whole sort of, I mean, the 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 mini Moog's basic fixed fixed uh, panel architecture is like the foundation for every synth. I mean, not every synth. People have gone on to do, you know, Buchla inspired synths. But I mean, up until recent years, basically every well, not I shouldn't say only till recent years. I mean, obviously the DX7 isn't based on on that, but I mean, this is the foundations of like synths, you know, and it and it's and it's it's been forever, and it's ne it's not going away. Like next year, somebody will make a a synth that everyone's going to be all excited and drooling about, it, and it's basically going to have the same fixed architecture structure as the Mini Moog, you know. So this is really, to me, ground zero of like popular synthesis. Yeah, well, all the other gear that you talked about lusting over, and some of the things Matthew's got in the background, and I might have some of it in the background for me as well, but the Roland stuff, when people are lusting over vintage gear, it is essentially a couple of oscillators, or three if it's a mini Moog, mixed into a filter with an envelope and a VCA with another envelope, or even the same one. But yeah, it's definitely that is a synth. If you were to say what is a synth, I think that's what everyone yeah. would say pretty much. Yeah. Well, anyways, and then the other thing that I wanted to say is that... Um, now I'm kind of now talking about this, about this documentary as though it's going to be like a like like I Dream of Wires, like a nerd, like a synth gearhead film, and it's really not going to be. It is really going to be more of a biographical documentary about Bob Moog, but I don't even necessarily think that it has to be limited to a synth audience, and we're not going to be really making it in that way. I mean, of course there will be synths because this is the story of. Bob Moog, there will be synth talk, but I mean, I feel like we've already covered that ground very well, like the synth nerd doc with I Dream of Wires. That's not really what we want to do here. We really want to kind of uh, do, you know, a biographical documentary about his life. I mean, I think that it's, you know, it's pretty interesting. You kind of think of like this person who more or less, you know, invented the foundations of synthesizers that we know today. And you sort of think like this person, you know, and he's a famous guy and people know the name Moog, you know. Uh, but he didn't have a life where he was like living triumph after triumph. I mean, he had a lot of, uh, it was like a, lo a lot of struggles and difficulties to kind of be the guy who introduced this radical new concept into the music world. It wasn't met with, you know, acclaim and, and it wasn't like he put out a, put out a Moog synthesizer and everyone was like, oh yeah, amazing. I mean, it took years of struggle to to uh, get people to uh, understand what it was he was trying to do. So, I mean, I think that that's, that's really interesting. This isn't like a story of, you know, triumph after triumph. There's a lot of, um, I mean, it's like the story of anyone who's like an innovator, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's not, it, what, yeah, it can't have been it's, it'd be really naive to think it was just this easy. I've made this thing, and people just yeah. have, and it's. it's I mean, you know, like I, I look at it this way: people like to see a. Do I mean, people who are not computer nerds, you know, are interested in seeing a documentary about Steve Jobs. I think there's some similarity here. I don't. Of course, I would like for everyone who's interested in synthesizers to see our movie, but I also hope and think that we're going to make a movie that would have more of a universal. Um, appeal because people understand the idea or people appreciate the idea of someone who you know who who is innovative and who changed the world with their ideas even though it took a lot of struggle to get there yeah yeah whatever I like I said for Steve Jobs with computers or mm -hmm. anything else um, personal question personal curiosity um, are you going to be doing the soundtrack like you did I Dream of Wires? No. No, I'm not going to. Easy question. <laughs> um, okay. uh, well, the re I mean, okay, first of all, again, back to the, uh, back to the budget thing. Um, I mean, one of the considerations, well, first of all, Rob asked me to do the I Dream of Wires soundtrack before I was even involved in the film. You know, it was like a small-scale thing. He met me. I mean, basically the way that Rob met me is because he... Uh, discovered my music, and he sent me an email and was like, you know, 
I discovered your music and I really like it and uh, I just noticed that you're from Toronto and can I you know come, actually come over and buy some of your CDs from you and I was like yeah sure and so he came over and like that's how that's how we met um, and so he was sort of was like a fan of my music to begin with and this was like a small scale project and he was just like mm, I wonder if Solvent would do the soundtrack and so I sort of came on board early on but then the reason that it even continued, you know, this is another thing that came up a lot with I Dream of Wires, you know, you talked about Wendy Carlos, why didn't you, license, you know, why, how could you play, or talk about uh, Switched on Bach and not play any of that music? Well, I don't know, $75,000 to license a Wendy Carlos track, <laughs> why didn't we use it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Me, I didn't, I didn't, we didn't have to pay me to, to fill it up with uh, solvent music. You know, I, I, for the record, I just made up that figure, $75,000. But really, that's not even crazy. No. Licensing music is super, for, for films, is super expensive, especially if it's like a, a really important historical piece of music like Switched on Bach. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it was $75,000 or something insane. I mean, there were some pieces that we considered licensing that were like, not that not that big of a deal, I assumed, and they were going to cost us like five thousand dollars, and we're like, mm, no, I think I think I can make something that sounds a bit like that, or you know, that'll. But this is one of the reasons why, with Electronic Voyager, our Kickstarter, the budget is, you know, we've aimed quite high. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, we may have trouble raising that amount of money, but we have, I and mean, this is going to be a big budget thing because I don't want to have it so that when we're talking about Keith Emerson we play a solvent track that sounds kind of like Keith Emerson. I don't want to do that. We have to do this one properly. Like, I, you know, I feel like this is an important story that needs to be done right. And so when we talk about Keith Emerson, we want to be able to license Keith Emerson. When we talk about Switched on Bach, we want to be able to, hopefully, I don't know if that one's possible, but we'd like to be able to license something from Switched on Bach, you know, et cetera. So this is a historical piece, so I just don't think, I don't have any personal ego that wants to get my own music in just for the sake of it, you know. I, I, I want to do what's right for the film, and I would rather this one, with it being a historical movie, I want to use historically accurate music. I mean, if there's a reason to put in, like, a you know, let's say a, a theme song, we need a theme song, and we want something contemporary, and it makes sense for me to compose something new, I mean, it's not like... It's not like it's an, it's an impossibility, but generally it wouldn't. Generally, it won't be like a solvent soundtrack. I just don't think that that's appropriate for this project. Yeah. Right. That was going to be the next question. That what will the soundtrack be then? Will it be um, all Mogwai stuff, or um, a case of pulling in these significant tracks, which is what you said. You know, you're talking about Keith Emerson. Um, Did you you look up at the um, Mother Mallard group? Yeah, we have a we have an interview confirmed with uh, David Borden. Oh, excellent, Mallard. Yeah, yeah. yeah and actually, there's a there's a Bob Moog Day happening in Trumansburg, which we are Trumansburg is where the first Moog yeah. factory was, and uh, that's where David Borden worked for Moog Music. Well, like the the Mother Mallard, for you guys, if you don't know, they were like, for want of a better word, like the Moog in-house band. Effectively, they used to like practice on their equipment at, at the at the store, didn't they, in the evenings? And that's how they kind of got into uh, then releasing stuff. Yeah, and a, so anyways, at this Moog Day in Trumansburg, which we're hoping to attend, uh, Mother Mallard is actually performing live for like the first time in wow. 25 years. Or so. I think, I think I'm, sh I mean, I know he's playing live, but I think it's something like the first time in 25 years. So we are I mean, we've already confirmed that he's going to be interviewed, and uh, hopefully we'll even be able to film that performance. That'd be great, because those are, I mean, again, those are the sort of the juicy bits for the for the synth geek, you know, all of us. Everyone knows about, you know, the Keith Emerson, Wendy Carlos, etc. but those are really interesting. If you've not heard those two LPs that they did, you should check them out, because they're just quite insane. Really. I haven't actually heard them myself, to be honest. <laughs> really good. They're, they're really, they're, there's some stuff that's kind of conventional in inverted commas, kind of quite virtuos, virtuoso kind of play. But then there's some just really, really out there tracks that are just kind of like nothing I've heard before and don't really sound like what you would 
particularly think a Moog sound would sound yeah. like. The is it all, is it completely electronic, or is it is yeah, there like? All all electronic. Electronic. Oh, it's all electronic. Yeah, yeah. If you can see, the, you know, I check. Well, I know it, the stuff's been reissued recently. I know it was yeah. reissued on like Superior Viaduct label, I think. Right. Yeah, I, I haven't checked it out, but I, yeah, I well I, worth it. Well worth it because they they really are. Uh, I think they would, if if anything, if you could secure rights to those, would make fantastic kind of, you know, just interlude type bits because they're all just they're all instrumental as well. So. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the kind of thing that's a little bit more in reach than. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, I mean, I hope that we can, you know, that we can include some music like Wendy Carlos and stuff. It'll really depend on what kind of budget we can pull together. Yeah. Um, well, I guess now I can screen share, and um, now's a good time to actually share the Kickstarter for those that will see this in time. Um, at the time of filming, there's still 21 days. There might be a couple of weeks left by the time this is actually uploaded. But um, So is this going to be several rounds of funding? Uh, does this fund the first part, and then you're expecting to do it again, or is this... An ambitious you know, I, I mean, no, we're not. I mean, the only thing I can say is, you know, if it doesn't reach its goal, we may have to do it again. But no, we're not going to do several rounds. Um, I mean, I'll tell you, you know, we, we, you know, we had some success with I Dream of Wires, so we're not really in the same position that we were in before. I do. I have been speaking to some distributors that are very interested in the, the documentary already. So I'm hoping that, you know, if we can say, hey, look, we've got X amount of money that we've managed to do ourselves and we've been able to start the filming, that we're going to be able to find people like distributors or broadcasters or somebody like that to kick in the rest. I mean, I'm pretty confident that we will. It's really hard when you have zero to get someone like that to be the first one to kick in, but if you're kind of coming, at, coming to them saying, you know, uh, look, We've already raised this much money. Look, obviously, people are interested in seeing this documentary made. Uh, we've done some filming. You know, it's much easier to convince people to kick in money at yeah. that stage than it is at at stage zero. You know, <laughs> when something's happening, yeah. Um, yeah. I'll just screen share again, and that was the point I wanted to pick up on. Um, this is Bob Morg's daughter following yeah. his footsteps. Um, That's right. Yeah, I, 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 I probably should have explained <laughs> explained that more. Yeah, she's she's actually going to be be the film's host. Um, so basically, the idea of the film, the way that we're going to be telling Bob Moog's story, is Michelle is basically going to be retracing his footsteps. So you know, she's going to we're going to start off where Bob Moog grew up, which was in New York. Uh, you know, we're going to visit the high school that he attended, um, try to maybe find some, some students that were, that were there with him at the same time, talk to them, uh, then, you know, go to Trumansburg, show where the factory was. So it's really kind of going to be a road trip, and we don't really want to just have this be kind of like a series of talking heads, like where, you know, here we're talking to Herb Deutsch, and there's, there he is sitting there. We'd like to actually do things like, you know, bring Herb Deutsch to Trumansburg and, you know, show this is the house where Bob and I got together in the basement and formulated, you know, the ADSR that we all know now, you know. So we want to kind of, it's really going to be more, it's not going to be a, a, a series of talking heads. It's going to be really kind of like more of a retracing his footsteps, like going from Trumansburg and then finally ending up in Asheville where he founded Moog music and eventually passed away. So that's that's really the the, the format of the film, and um, I mean it's it, it's it's great really having Michelle because, you know, this is she's not only it's not only Bob's daughter. She runs the Bob Moog Foundation. She's the executive director. So she's basically dedicated her life to um, Bob Moog's legacy. So this is her passion in life, and so you know when she talks to people like. Uh, you know, David Borden or Herb Deutsch or uh, Rick Wakeman, people like that, they've all met her and they know that, you know, they, they know that this is Bob's daughter and that she has, you know, really dedicated herself to Bob Moog's legacy. And so I think, the it, you know, 
if it were to be me conducting the interviews, I, I'm the one who conducted most of the interviews for Adrian and Wires, and that was great because I, I can synth nerd out with, with the best of them, right? But when it comes to, like, the details of Bob Moog's history, I'm not going to claim to be, like, the ideal historian to really be sitting in front of Rick Wakeman and asking him about his time with Bob Moog, you know? I think that having Michelle is really key to getting real... Um, real, like, personal and well-informed questions and conversations. Well, I think there's a, a certain, not only relaxed atmosphere, but more connected atmosphere when it's something like that. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, they, you know, I, Michelle has said, I mean, for a lot of these people, you know, Bob Mo really changed their life, you know? I mean, if you think of somebody like Rick Wakeman, Gary Newman, this is this guy, he made the instrument that basically defined their career. Or if we're talking outside of the realm of musicians, you know, we're going to be talking to a lot of people who were uh, Moog employees and who worked closely with them. I mean, these are people where Bob Moog was like a defining uh, person in their life. And so to have some miscellaneous guy like me asking questions about Bob Moog is going to be nowhere near as effective as as Bob's daughter because they're just they are going to feel some kind of some kind of personal connection there with that yeah so in terms of people keeping up with the project and as we said there'll be some Kickstarter left to support this um, by the time it's live but beyond that um, where's best for people keeping in touch with what's happening um, time scales and, and things like yeah. that well I mean we've got a website electronicvoyager.com we're on Facebook, Facebook slash Electronic Voyager, and Twitter, uh, Twitter slash Moog Documentary is the one for that. So I don't know. Those are the three things that I am really keeping up to date, I guess, at this time. And I guess it's it's the awkward, um, unanswerable question, but <laughs> what, yeah. what's the rough time scale for this? Is it um, a year off, if it's two years off, you know, really vague. Well, I think we, I think we would like to try to have it done and starting to screen theatrically, like spring of next year. Okay. I think that's. I mean, if if we get this funded, I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that. I mean, I'll tell you one thing. Why Dream of Wires took a long time to do to edit um, for Rob because. We didn't have any narrative there going in. We were just like, let's just interview everyone ever about, yeah. about modular sense. It was like, let's see what we get. Like, who, there was no like, okay, well, we're going to tell this, so we got to make sure that we get this person saying, you know, there was no narrative. And so, like, Rob pretty much, you know, went absolutely insane for about six months, like, looking over the the... 100 hour long interviews with people nerding out about modular sense and like how am I going to make a film about this um, but that's not going to be the case here I mean this is this, there's a very clear narrative here and that's Bob Moog's life so it's really not there's no reason for this to be nearly as complex to put together as I Dream of Wires was so that's why I feel like it's not totally unrealistic to say spring of 2017. I mean, I don't know. You know, good chances there'll be delays. Who knows? But <laughs> it's, yeah, well, I mean, I know the way that Rob works, and he 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 can get that done. I mean, I, I think it's totally uh, totally realistic with this narrative because it's you know it's clear cut. <laughs> You've got Rob shrugging in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not not to tie it to anything. And I know it's always an awkward question, but just a very rough. You know, it, I'm sure immediately it was a moment of excitement for me. Any of this sort of, any of the documentary stuff on Sims, I think a lot of people will just watch. But I think this one, having the story and being a broader biographical piece, I think will have a lot of people excited. And I thought, if I don't ask you, someone's going to comment saying, did you ask him when? Uh, I thought I'd yeah. better ask. Well, I was, can I just ask? I'll just ask, obviously with the I Dream of Wires, there was the extended version is yeah. it going to be anything like that, where there's a complementary thing to it, where it may be focusing on 
each one of the iconic pieces of equipment or something like that? I mean, I, yes. I you know, I would love for there to be an extended version of this because I you know we're going to gather a lot of material and it's you know it's it's a uh, I don't really know why a lot of documentary people don't do it because you know I like the way that the shortcut of iDream of Wires turned out in fact I would recommend that to most people even even a lot of synth people I think that you know the hardcore edition is meandering in a lot of places but that was the idea of it but the thing is also there were a lot of things that were amazing in the hardcore edition the, you know little parts of it that I loved or that were hilarious that just because of you know, trying to keep a narrative in the shortcut, you end up, ended up having to cut, and it's like so, so depressing to know of these like amazing bits. That are exactly. I thought you hit on a really good format doing it like that because obviously the, these these are niche documentaries anyway, and within this niche, there are obviously yeah. super nerds like yourself who yeah. are always scrambling for that extra little bit of information or shot of something. So yeah. I think it kind of really covers all bases there, where you can kind yeah. of. Well, I'll tell you one thing. If 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 we do do a like a a long cut of the Moog documentary, it won't come out first. <laughs> that was that was kind of a weird thing that we did. <laughs> but that was just, just like oh, I don't even know. I'm not even going to bother explaining it. It was just <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 easier to make a long cut. Let's put it that way. It's yeah. harder to make a short cut, you know, because it's hard to it's hard to make something that's going to you know, we got Adrian Wires on Netflix. There's no way that the hardcore edition would go on Netflix. Mm-hmm. You know, Netflix would look at that and say, like, uh, you yeah. know, we're listening to this guy nerd on about soldering for ten minutes. Forget it. You know, like that's if that, that's not not going to uh, not going to fly for like your average person. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I'm sure we're going to gather enough material that we'll, we would be able to do that with this Moog documentary too. But it's, you know. Uh, we just kind of have to see where the where the where the finances are with this because it's also a lot of time to dedicate to this, and we'd also like to pursue other projects. I mean, I Dream of Wires took a long time to make, and it took it's, you know it's still going, and it's like it's only like five months ago or something that it didn't that it sort of stopped becoming my primary concern in life is like this film. I mean, it just. Right lasted so long and, and didn't make us you know very much money so I can't necessarily dedicate that same amount of time like I'm hoping that we can move on and, and be able to sort of do things in a more uh, quick way without having to like linger on a project forever like we did with I Dream of Wires <laughs> yeah well well as you said the filming must be completely different when there's a story to tell there's clear points to hit and, and at that point of hitting all these key points within the story there's not I guess you don't break off for two weeks and focus on getting all the extra stuff. You keep going and get the story told. That's the focus of the documentary. So, but I think we—I mean, I really do think we could, we will be able to do a long cut, and I hope, you know, I hope we can do that. I mean, really, what we did with *I Dream of Wires* was Rob just made the hardcore edition, and then it was like, how do we, you know, now it's time to edit this down, and it was like, Ugh, maybe we should just go with this, like, you know. Everyone's going to be, all these crazy modular synth nerds are going to be pissed off if there's not enough, like, Tony Rolando screen time, you know? So <laughs> better just, uh, better just like, give the give these people who supported this project what they want, and then we'll get to that other thing later, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's lots of definite logic to that. That's, that's why I was sort of saying, not that I'm telling you how to make your new documentary, but I could almost see it somehow, like, because you've got this kind of nice, succinct sort of uh, narrative with having, uh, uh, telling the story, but then almost if you did have an extended thing of, well, well, this is the original move modular, and this is how it sounds, or this is the mini move, that's yeah, the yeah. version. You see? So you can keep the story separate and then yeah. the hardware in another one. Yeah, and actually, we—I mean, we're we're kind of in luck with that kind of idea if we ever wanted to do that because we actually know um, a couple of like serious serious Moog collectors in Toronto, um, and there's this one guy that I mean, he has like everything. I've heard about this guy. <laughs> 
Graham at No Gaudio used to talk about this guy who's got one of, has he got like one of Wendy Carlos's old modulars or something? Uh, I haven't heard that. Now there's another guy who has uh, Gershon Kingsley's Moog modular, which wow. is like one that you know that, that that they made popcorn on. Yeah, wow. You guys, you guys know if you don't know popcorn by name, you've heard popcorn. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there is a guy, but that's not even the main collector guys. Like, like I'm saying, there's actually like a surprising number of like serious Mo collectors in the city. But there's just this one guy that literally was like, "Yeah, we have got to set this up where we go to the studio space." It's the studio space where in I Dream of Wires, we filmed uh, Per Per Ubu, and they, he, right. he set up with like all the EMS, not EMS, EML stuff. So he's got like a whole line of EML. Sorry? The Grand Avenue studio. Yeah, that's right. Grand Avenue, which is like where a lot of the Brian Eno ambient albums were recorded. Yeah, in Hamilton, really. That's fantastic, though. Yeah, so anyways, he's prepared to sort of set us up with a, a, a day or two where he brings basically like every Moog ever oh, to Grand Avenue just to sort of like have a, you know, so that if somebody says, oh, you know, when I first picked up the the my synthesizer 55, you know, we can have a shot of it or whatever. Yeah. You know, if we do an extended version, we can sort of let the wank out go for even a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. yeah, cool. Well, I guess that sort of covers everything, unless there's anything anyone else wants to ask or add or um, links to certain things. We obviously spoke about you and your music. Where's the best place for people to find um, just solvent? as opposed to the documentaries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, maybe the SoundCloud, you can hear. So it's soundcloud.com. Let me let me just check this. I'm just going to make sure that... I think it's slash solvent, but just let me make sure. Yeah, I mean, while you're finding uh, yourself on the internet, um, module... <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, 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 it's soundcloud.com slash solvent. So it's... <laughs> Yeah, so that should be easy enough. I mean, that's you know, that's that's where you go to. That's where you can hear some stuff really quickly. I mean, the stuff that I do, I guess I haven't really explained it, and I won't go into it for too long. But I mean, basically, it's like if people ask me about the music that I do, I would say that it's sort of um, like uh, Aphex Twin type instrumental electronica. Electronica, I hate that word. Whatever, you know. Aphex Twin type stuff, but with a definite strong synth pop uh, tone to it. Or I mean, like I've got synth pop. Vince Clark is like my hero. That, that that kind of synthesis, that kind of style is like in my blood. But I don't do stuff, you know, with with vocalists. So it's it's sort of different from that style of synth pop. It's more, yeah. I, I think you know, it's like a, a somewhere in the world between like Vince Clark and and early Aphex Twin, I would say. Yeah, so harmonic and melodic structure grounded in synth pop. Yeah, and but also with, you know, like with Aphex Twin, you'll hear sort of like strange noises and, and distorted drums and things like that, which are not a synth pop characteristic, whereas, you know, this is one of the reasons that I'm attracted to modular is I'm really into, like, fucked up sounds, you know, so I like to, I always like, you know, I may have a sweet, typical kind of, melodic lead line, but always in the background chugging away is some kind of like, you know, weird uh, insect kind of s sequences and stuff. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah. Well, modular podcast um, for us. Um, the topical monthly episodes that, you know, episode one, two, three, four, and so on uh, are continuing. This is a separate uh, MP interview or modular podcast interview um, that we'll just be interjecting in between as extra content. So electronicvoyager.com, soundcloud.com forward slash solvent. Um, obviously all the I Dream of Wires stuff that if you've been living under a rock and not seen, go watch it. It's on Netflix, as you said. Um, and yeah, that's all from us. Anything from anyone else before we sign off? Not me. No? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, cool. Well, yeah, I'll see everyone next time. Thank you.